This meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation today, you can type them into the Q&A located on the bottom toolbar of the Zoom screen and we'll answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, March 15th uh, edition of Crop Talk. And this will be the uh, last of our winter uh, crop talks as we uh, start progressing into spring. And then we'll be doing our spring crop talks, which will begin in April. So um, uh, hopefully by that time, we'll be seeing a little bit less snow out there and uh, maybe some, uh, some, some dry ground or some black ground starting to show up. For today, uh, I thought it was going to be a good idea to uh, get John Gavlowski to talk, come on and, and talk about some of the beneficial insects that uh, we see out in the fields, uh, get them to go through how to identify them and what are they doing in the fields, kind of how are they helping us out in the fields. Uh, we're uh, starting to learn more and more about them. I'm definitely seeing a lot more articles about them in, in the papers and, and magazines. And uh, so I thought it would be uh, good for uh, John to come up on and, and give us a little bit of an update there. And uh, I guess with that, uh, I'll hand the screen over to John and we'll get right into his uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Lionel. I'll give me one sec here just to find my screen. Sometimes if you move your mouse either to the bottom or the top of your screen, the panel will come up. Yeah, no, I've just done the share screen and just have to find, try that one more time. Can you see my screen right now, Lionel? Uh, no, we can't. Oh, okay. That's weird. We'll try this. There we go. Something's happening now. Still okay, can't but... see. So at the yeah, very no, bottom, I... if you click on the PowerPoint there, you should if it's on power no on the very yeah right there and then it should there we go and then start Hello. your powerpoint here we go okay thanks then, very much you're just going to want to go to display settings and swap your display screen perfect okay very good. Okay, well, thanks for the help there. So yeah, today we'll be talking about beneficial insects. And uh, just start by mentioning that um, you you would have noticed that in a lot of years, we get insects that will, will have very cyclical populations where we'll use the example of cutworms, you might get a couple really bad years, and then populations seem to drop off for a few years things cycle back a few years later. And there's a couple of reasons that those cycles can happen. One is weather related, but another one and quite an important one is natural enemies, beneficial insects that are uh, eating our crop feeding insects. And uh, in, in many years, they're what are regulating these cycles. So they're an important group. So what we're going to explore today is some of the roles that beneficial insects have on the farm, uh, the impact of some beneficial insects, so how beneficial are they, ways that we can conserve them. And I do have three questions built into my presentation. So uh, there is no, oops, did we just lose our screen there? Can you guys still see my screen, Aaron? Yeah, we, uh, we did lose it. If you could uh, start sharing again. 
Okay, well, I'll try this one more time. Great, just swap your display settings again. At the top, John? Um, where your it, screen change. Where it says display settings? Yeah, I'm not seeing that. Um, we can see your PowerPoint. Um, you're, we're just, we're seeing your next slide too, so. Oh, okay, because yeah, I, I don't see it. That's the problem. Um, hmm. So if you take your, your PowerPoint, if you go to the bottom right, uh, there'll be uh, like a, a screen, full screen. Just maybe click on that. Okay, can you see it now? We still see your both uh, your uh, first slide you're talking about and the next slide coming up. Okay, that's not good. So can you see the display settings again, John? No, I just have my slide right now and that is it. And there's a, something saying stop sharing and hide. So you're working on two screens likely? Um, I, well, I, I've got, no, I'm just working on one screen, just my laptop, but there's a monitor in behind, which I've just turned off. I'm not sure if I should, because the, the only things I can hit here are stop sharing and hide. So on your second monitor is probably where you'd have to swap that display setting. Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Problem is on the monitor, I don't have any mouse control. That's all just on my laptop. Yeah, it's just gonna use the same mouse. And if you're using two monitors, you should be able to just move it over right to the other monitor. Yeah, no, my apologies. I, I, I can only uh, function the mouse on the laptop, not the, oh, here we go. Now something came over. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Now just go back to your original or your beginning slides. Perfect. Okay, good to go. You bet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, okay, thanks for uh, the patience. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got three beneficial insect quiz questions built into my presentation as well. So we'll go through them as well. Um, just a, a slide to go over some of the beneficial roles that insects have on the farm. So insects will feed on our crops, our livestock, our stored grains, but I've listed five ways that insects can be beneficial on the farm. Um, certainly pollinating crops. Uh, some crops do get a yield boost from pollinators, including crops like canola and sunflowers. Even though they don't rely on them, they get a yield boost from them, from the pollinators. Um, certainly insects either prey on or parasitize other insects. We've got insects that eat weed seeds. Um, ground beetles are an obvious one. The field cricket in my photo, they're also um, an insect that will eat weed seeds, as well as being, they're omnivores, they're also predaceous on some things. We've got insects that decompose stubble, dung, and other animals, so decomposers. And just through their movement in the soil, insects can improve the soil. And that's one area that probably gets um, under-recognized at times. So this slide shows uh, 10 different orders of insects or arachnids that can be beneficial. I'm not going to go over all 10 orders. I'm going to touch on five of these groups, the five major groups. So the ones I've got an asterisk beside your true bugs, your lace wings, beetles, flies, and some of our uh, beneficial wasps. So those will be the five groups that I'll be covering and I'll, I'll show you 11 different beneficial insects in total or insect or insect groups rather. So the first order we'll cover will be 
the hemiptera. So hemiptera are our true bugs. Um, they've got sucking mouth parts, so they don't chew their prey. They put their beak in and um, suck the juice out of their prey, essentially. And the first group of these that we'll look at are the minute pirate bugs. So they call them minute for a reason. These are small little things. Um, you will see these in many, many crops. They're, they're quite widespread. We've got about 39 species in Canada. Um, the, the ones, the species we have here in Manitoba, um, generally just two or three millimeters long. They're tiny little things. So you do have to look hard to really see them and appreciate what they are. I often see them up on sunflower heads, probably feeding on insect eggs up there. Um, Soybean plants, you often see them on soybeans if you look hard enough. And especially if there are soybean aphids, they like to come in and feed on the soybean aphids. Uh, what they do is they inject some digestive enzymes into their prey and then they basically suck the juice out of them. So here's a slide showing just how good they can be at feeding on soybean aphids. Um, the older juveniles will be eating about eight aphids per day, and the adult females about 11 aphids per day. Um, they are tiny insects. Some other insects will eat a lot more aphids per day, but uh, having these helps. And one thing that is extra beneficial with minute pirate bugs, if prey is absent, they will feed on pollen and plant material to some degree. It's not their preference. They really don't do a lot of plant feeding but they can sustain themselves on um, plant sap or pollen if prey isn't there. So they're often one of the first predators on the scene when aphids do start moving in. Another true bug that is in our fields is damsel bugs. Uh, damsel bugs, there's 22 different species in Canada, so another relatively diverse group. I'm gonna show you some um, later on that are much, much more numerous. Uh, damsel bugs though, quite common. They are very quick and they are great at um, finding and tracking down prey. So they have a bit of a broader diet. It's not just um, easy prey like aphids. So they will go after things like caterpillars. They really like feeding on things like diamondback moth. They've been noted as an important predator of diamondback moth. And the study that I'm citing here um, is a little bit artificial. They were keeping damsel bugs in a lab situation and tossing them diamondback moth larvae and eggs and basically looking at how many they would kill in a day. And so the numbers I'm showing you here are really high. Uh, they killed an average of 131 eggs and 95 diamondback moth larvae by single female in 24 hours. Now keep in mind these were hungry and they didn't have to search for their prey and um, often with damsel bugs they will put their beak into, inject their venom into and kill more prey than they eat. So it doesn't mean that they ate all 95 larvae. They were just easy prey to kill and uh, at some point um, to eat. But they, they um, are very good, fairly aggressive predators, and again, quite common in many of our fields. And just a couple of other interesting facts about damsel bugs. They have been found to feed on flea beetles. Um, I wouldn't go as far as suggesting flea beetles are an important part of their diet. I don't think that is the case. Uh, I think these are more anecdotal observations that uh, entomologists have come across. So. They have been found feeding on flea beetles, but again, I don't think that that's a huge part of their diet, just because flea beetles are quick and would be um, a much less convenient meal than something like an aphid or a diamondback moth. And they've also been found feeding on ligus bugs. Uh, again, very quick insects. One of the few things that will actually uh, catch and prey on things like ligus bugs. And just before we leave the true bugs, I just want to mention that there are a few predaceous stink bugs. Now, we do have plant feeding stink bugs, but there's a subfamily of stink bugs called Asopinae, and members of that 
subfamily of stink bugs are all predaceous. Uh, I have seen uh, the one on the um, left is the spine soldier bug, and I have seen these with their beaks into caterpillars before. So, and in fact, some fairly big caterpillars even, they will tackle caterpillars even much bigger than themselves. So um, they can certainly be helpful. Um, not as numerous as the pirate bugs and damsel bugs that I showed you though. You will find the odd one. Another group that can be quite common and quite beneficial is the lace wings. And I'm showing you two different species here um, or two different groups the brown lace wings and the green lace wings the brown lace wings can be really common more in forested areas areas with a lot of shrubs even shelter belts um, i had some sticky traps next to a shelter belt last year and uh, a lot of brown lace wings were unfortunately ending up in my sticky traps um, the green lace wings, though, you will find them right throughout a field. They like to go and start feeding on um, things like aphids, insect eggs, caterpillars. Their larvae are really what uh, it does the most damage to the prey. So the picture on your left is a lace wing larva. Looks like a little brown alligator. And actually what is in its mandibles is a ligus bug juvenile. So again, quite quick, able to track down and um, consume many different types of prey. Uh, what they will do, they've got two sickle-like um, jaws and they put those into their prey and they inject a, enzymes or digestive secretions into their prey. So it starts digesting the prey and then they basically suck up the juice. So you will see a little um, shell left behind. So when they finish sucking the juice out of the ligus bug, you have a little skin left over. Um, I'm going to show you some other alligator shaped things later on that just move in and consume the whole piece of prey. And some um, other interesting observations on green lace wings. They have been observed feeding on diamondback moth larvae and cocoons. So if there's a lot of diamondbacks on the plant and they're around, they will start feeding on those, nice meal for them. And they also have been found feeding on flea beetles, but once again, I think that is probably a very small part of their diet. Uh, if they can catch them, they will eat them. But, uh, but again, there's, flea beetles just don't have anything that feeds on them to any large extent, which is one of the problems we have trying to manage flea beetles. Next group that I'll cover is our beneficial beetles. And we've got quite a few groups of beneficial beetles. So I've only, I've picked out three groups to cover, but there are a lot of predaceous beetles out there. So the three I'm gonna cover are three of our major groups. Um, and, and the first one I'm gonna cover is the ground beetles. These are very diverse, very common beetles. There's over 370 species that have been recorded in Manitoba, and actually over 980 species have been recorded in Canada. And just to put that into perspective, that's about twice the number of bird species that we have in Canada. So uh, very, very diverse group of beetles. And if you look in any field that has not had a broad spectrum insecticide application recently, you will find ground beetles, again, very diverse, uh, very common. Um, some species are quite small and others are very large and quite noticeable. They tend to be nocturnal. So during the day, they're not very active. They're probably hiding under a clump of soil or some stubble. Um, so you have to move the trash around to actually find them. Um, You'll see them scurrying around if you do disturb them. They can be black, brown. Um, some of them are even metallic colors like green. Um, they're, they're all very quick, very streamlined. And if you look at their head, you will see some um, pretty intimidating looking mandibles. The picture on the right is a ground beetle larva. You would find these right in the soil. They like to live in the soil. They will feed on things crawling on the soil and within the soil. 
and things consumed by ground beetles, uh, basically whatever they can catch. So things like cutworms, they will climb on plants. Some species will climb up the plants and feed on eggs, larvae, and pupa of things like potato beetles. Um, there's even a couple of species that we've seen up on sunflower heads feeding on things like sunflower beetles, banded sunflower moth. So some species climb, some species like to hang out more on or in the soil. There are some that will be in the soil, even feeding on root maggots and things like that. Um, and even wheat midge larvae, when they drop from the wheat onto the soil, they can be susceptible to ground beetles. Study in Alberta, they found that ground beetles um, were quite prevalent in the field and were quite effective predators of redback cutworm. So uh, very good cutworm predators. In fact, uh, we had a ground beetle that we kept as a pet in our lab here at work for a while, one summer, and we were feeding them cutworms to keep them going. And our ground beetle that we call Peter would consume usually about six or eight cutworms in a day. So uh, hard to keep Peter um, well fed. Yeah, they can have a big appetite. And some species of ground beetles will feed on weed seeds. So a couple genera, the, the brown one that I showed in my introductory slide to ground beetles, uh, that belongs to the genus Harpalus, and it was one of the species that uh, likes to feed on weed seeds as well as prey. So doubly beneficial. Okay, so here's another group of beetles that I think is really um, probably not well understood and because of where they live, not well appreciated. These are the rove beetles. And it's a huge group of beetles, uh, like the ground beetles, very diverse, uh, about 390 species in Manitoba and over 1700 species in Canada for rove beetles. So very diverse group. Most are predators of other insects, but you don't see them a lot. They're small and they like to live in the soil. So they're moving around in the soil, feeding on insect eggs, um, things like root maggots, and um, things that they can encounter in the soil that are um, small enough that they would enjoy consuming. So what you're seeing in this slide, um, taken by a colleague in Alberta, is a cluster of root maggot eggs and these Aliacra rove beetles are dining on the root maggot eggs. And one study that was done in, here in Canada found that on average, one adult of this species, Aliacra bilineata, consumed about 23 eggs or 2.6 larvae of root maggots per day. So um, again, they can help out, uh, especially if you have uh, a lot of these in your field. So this is our first quiz. And so I won't know if you get it right or not, but you, I've got three questions that you can quiz yourself on. And these are three things that are, are good to know, especially the first two that I'm gonna quiz you on. There are things that I've had um, farmers and agronomists send me photos of and say, I am seeing a lot of these, should I be controlling them? So this is our first one. We're still on the beetles, so your hint is this is a type of beetle larva. What is it? And the answer is this is a lady beetle larva. So this is what a ladybug or lady beetle larva looks like. They look like um, little gray alligators, essentially. Now, some species are black. It varies with the species. We've actually got about 66 species of lady beetles in Manitoba, so quite diverse group. And of course, they like to feed on things like aphids, uh, insect eggs, even some small caterpillars for some species. It varies with the species. Uh, but some species can eat a lot in a day. I'm going to show you some data here just to demonstrate that. So this study was done at the University of Guelph. And what they did was they were feeding um, soybean aphids to different species of lady beetles and the seven spotted lady beetle which is probably our most common species here they can eat on average about 115 soybean aphids in 24 hours 
Uh, the males eat about 78. The males don't eat quite as much as the females in most species of lady beetles, just because the females have the reproductive needs. But even the more fully grown juveniles can eat over 100 aphids per day per individual. So big appetites. Multicolored Asian lady beetle, um, that probably nowadays competes with seven spotted lady beetle as our dominant species. It's an introduced species accidentally introduced. It's also the one that's good at getting into your homes in the uh, fall, but they do have big appetites for aphids as well. Um, eating pretty much the same level as the seven spotted lady beetle. The females were eating about 95 soybean aphids per day, males about 54, and the older juveniles about 112 aphids per individual. So if you start seeing a few lady beetle larvae or adults per plant, uh, you've got a good thing going there. Um, even if you're starting to get close to threshold, I would just keep an eye on things and see if they can clean up the population. We have seen aphid populations crash because of high levels of lady beetles, lace wings, hoverflies, and other natural enemies. So good thing to be watching for when you're doing your scouting. And there are some thresholds that now can factor in the natural enemies and try to help you out so that suppose you are for soybean aphids going above that 250 per plant. However, you've noticed we've got a lot of lady beetle larvae, some hoverfly larvae, some pirate bugs. There is an app out there called Aphid Advisor and what it has you do is count your soybean aphids, but also to count your lady beetles, your lace wings, your hoverflies, and to factor all that into um, the decision. So you would enter all this into the app. The app does all the, the mathematics and it gives you a decision, spray, don't spray. But it's a way of factoring natural enemies into our decision-making. These are called dynamic action thresholds when they factor in the natural enemies. So a couple more groups to cover. Um, the, the flies, now most people think of flies as pesky things, but we have to appreciate there are, just like the beetles, there's actually quite a few groups of flies, families of flies that are mainly beneficial in their role. Um, and there's, there's several groups that are very good um, predators and in one case parasites of other insects. I'm going to show you three groups. Once again, there's more than three that I could be showing you. I could easily show you uh, a half dozen groups of flies that are common here in Manitoba and um, quite beneficial. We will focus on three of them. The first one, though, that I want to show you, um, we're going to start with a quiz once again. So um, and this was a situation that happened a, a couple of times last year. I had people send me photos of slug-like insects that look like this. And their question was, these are all over my wheat heads. And I also had this come from a pea field um, where somebody was finding a lot of these. And they were asking, what are these things? They're all over, in this case, it was the wheat heads. Are they of concern? And should I be spraying for these? Uh, they were worried that they might be some sort of army worm or something. These are the larvae of hoverflies. And they are there because you had aphids there. And that's what they are after is your aphids. That's all they feed on. They will not feed on your crop. So the answer to the um, agronomist's inquiry in this case was do not spray the field. You could go out and see what the aphid population is still like. But if you're seeing a lot of hoverfly larva, uh, I think you missed the boat on the aphids and they may have the population in control for you. So hoverflies, a huge group of insects. We've got over 530 species in Canada and there's over 6,000 species worldwide. So humongous group of flies. Um, some people will call them flower flies or surfid flies. So those are other synonyms for hoverflies. You will often see them hovering at flowers. So when they approach a flower, they will often hover like a helicopter so if you see that behavior, 
it's not a bee or a wasp, it's a hoverfly. A lot of people mistake hoverflies for bees or wasps. They're very good bee and wasp mimics, and that helps protect them. They don't have a stinger like a bee or wasp, they can't sting, but just looking like a bee or a wasp, um, a lot of things just will not eat them. So well protected that way. And the adults are actually considered the second most important group of pollinators after the bees. So they do help contribute to pollination as adults. But it's the larva that really um, can be beneficial to people growing field crops. Uh, the larva feed on mainly aphids. They will feed on a few other things, uh, thrips and uh, some other tiny insects, but aphids by far are their favorite food. Um, and the adults usually lay most of their eggs right into aphid colonies. And the reason this happens is because um, the adult flies, they can smell the honeydew from the aphids. So aphids, when they feed, they are ingesting a lot of plant sap uh, to get the nutrients they need. And they secrete a liquid called honeydew. And the honeydew has a smell to it. You probably can't smell it when you're walking through the field. The hoverflies can. Um, so where you have lots of aphids, you have lots of honeydew. That draws in the hoverflies. They lay their eggs right in the aphid colonies. And when the eggs hatch, you have these blind legless larvae that are right inside the aphid colony. So they start tapping around with their tapered mouth parts. And um, they've got like a hook for a, um, a mouth part. And they'll impale an aphid, hold it up, suck the juice out, plop it down and grab another one and just keep doing that. So really beneficial. Uh, middle picture here, um, these kind of teardrop shaped things up on the plant, those are hoverfly pupae. So uh, years when hoverflies are quite abundant, like last year, you may see lots of these in some of your crops. So don't worry, these are good not eggs of something bad. So um, experiment here where they were looking at how many um, aphids this species of hoverfly episurface uh, ate over its lifetime as a larva and they found that they could consume a maximum of about 396 aphids. This was a lab study but people have recorded higher numbers than this in field experiments. Uh, they figure that um, lower assumption was, um, rates, oh, sorry, this was a field experiment where they got the 396. They, they've had higher rates in lab studies, but of course in lab studies, they don't have to search as much. And um, as we discussed earlier, um, there are, are reasons why things will often eat more in the lab situation, but in a field situation, close to 400 aphids per larva were consumed over the life of that larva. So our third quiz question is, uh, you're digging around in the soil and you find a bunch of these white worm-like things in the soil and you notice that they're quite active and um, they're hanging out around your crops. What are they? Do you need to worry? The answer is, no, you don't need to worry. These are larvae of a fly called the stiletto fly. Some people will call them therivids. Therividae is the family name. So these are predaceous fly larvae. You do not need to be worried about managing these. They live in the soil. They like to feed on things like wireworms and earthworms. Uh, we've got about 50 species of stiletto flies in Canada. The adults, the, you will commonly see these flying around, usually around July. Uh, that's usually when they start um, emerging as adults. They tend to be very hairy flies. Uh, often they almost look white sometimes because they're so hairy. So the white hairy flies that you often see, uh, good chance they could be stiletto flies. And again, their larvae are in the soil looking for things like wireworms, earthworms. Um, earth, uh, earthworms themselves are beneficial. We probably don't want them eating too many earthworms, but if you've got lots of wireworms in the field, small cutworms, things like that, 
Um, Solano flies would enjoy eating those. And the third group of flies I'll mention is a group that's actually uh, parasitic. They're called tachinid flies and a hugely diverse group. We've got about 730 species of tachinid flies in Canada, so very diverse. And what they do is they lay their eggs on the side of other insects. Often it's things like caterpillars or beetles, and you'll, if you look carefully, you may see a white egg on the side of the caterpillar or beetle. So what happens, those eggs will hatch and they will, the larva that hatches from the egg burrows right into the caterpillar or beetle or whatever the host is and lives inside the caterpillar and feeds from the inside out. Eventually they end up killing their host, but they will be living inside for a period of time prior to that. Um, the picture on the lower right is actually a Bertha armyworm, and that white ring on the back with a hole in the middle, that's a breathing hole for the larva of uh, a particular tachinid fly called a Thrissia cinerea. Uh, so there, that's the fly on the left, the same species. Very hairy flies, usually a very hairy abdomen, um, but not white hairs like the slitter flies. They're usually long bristly black hairs on the abdomen of the tachinid flies. Um, when the larva is inside, they will make this little breathing hole for themselves. So if you are scouting for Bertha armyworms and you see these little white patches on the back, uh, those are parasitized larvae. They're probably going to die shortly anyway. So the last group I want to cover is our parasitic wasps. And when we use the word wasp, it tends to alarm people. People tend to think of yellow jackets, but really um, wasps are hugely diverse and most species cannot sting people at all. Most species of wasps are actually parasitic and what they will be doing is laying eggs into other insects. So this slide here gives you some idea just how diverse parasitic wasps are. There's one group we call the ichneumonids. The ichneumonids alone, um, there's over 3,000 species that have been named in Canada. Braconids, another group, hugely diverse, over 1,100 species. So the, if you do the math on the uh, four groups I've got listed here, there's more than four groups of parasitic wasps. I've listed our top four. We, you're already over about 4,500 species. So hugely diverse. So my caution is when you're out doing sweep net sampling and you open up your net and you have all these little black specks that start flying away, don't panic and don't make the assumption that something bad is happening in your field. Those little black specks, many of them could be parasitic wasps and you want them there because they are what is helping to regulate your caterpillars, possibly some of the beetles. Um, they will lay eggs into many different types of hosts. Some like to lay eggs into aphids. So uh, it really varies with the species. And again, we've got lots of species. So I'll just cover two or three different types of parasitic wasps. Um, one that I'll show you is an important one of diamondback moth. It's called diadegma. And so diadegma doesn't overwinter in Canada or Manitoba, um, neither does diamondback moth. What happens when diamondback moth gets blown in from the south, in some years you also get high levels of diadegma being blown in. If they are abundant, what they will be doing is laying their eggs into uh, the diamondback larva and eventually the, the, the larva will turn into a pupa, but then it doesn't become an adult. It will die in the pupa stage. Uh, the, uh, the diadegma will basically hijack the pupa cocoon and use that to emerge as a wasp. And one of the studies on diadegma found that um, areas that have a lot of uh, flowering plants throughout the growing season, 
tended to have more diadegma and other parasitoids in the area. So um, for people who do keep some, um, a variety of flowering vegetation around their farm site, that can be good. The, the larva of these parasitic wasps are in other insects. The adults though, often do feed on nectar and pollen as their main food sources as, as adults. So having some flowering plants around will attract in more parasitic wasps and help them to survive better. So another parasitic wasp that I'll point out that we sometimes see a lot of is something called Bancus flavescens. And it's a quite large orange wasp and what it's laying its eggs into in these photos is diamond, uh, sorry, Bertha armyworm. Um, they, they like to lay their eggs into the young, the very young instars or, or larva of Bertha armyworm. And the, the larva of Bankus is living right inside the Bertha armyworm. And once they get to well, the middle instars, you will start seeing the caterpillars coming out of the Bertha armyworm. Um, so the, the slide on your right, a um, bit more mature Bertha armyworm, and you can see what is happening here. The Bertha armyworm has recently been killed by the Bankus uh, wasp larva, and the larva at this point is crawling out of the Bertha armyworm, and it will very shortly after it crawls out, make itself a cocoon. And then from that, you will get these, I'll call them moderately sized orange wasps. They, um, they're they certainly very visible when they're flying around in a canola field looking for Bertha. Um, you will notice them, especially if you get them in your sweep net samples. They're big enough. It's not just a little speck, uh, a bit bigger. You will definitely notice these. And one of the studies uh, done on one of the Bertha outbreaks a few decades ago, they found that parasitism by Bertha armyworm uh, uh, could control about 40% of the Bertha population. Um, so sorry, parasitism by Bankus flavescens could control about 40% of the Bertha armyworm population. So um, when they're abundant, they can have a big uh, impact on some of the caterpillars that they're attacking. And another one that I will point out that we have seen quite recently here in Manitoba is a wasp called Cotesia. So Cotesia, they're tiny little black wasps. They like to lay eggs into things like cutworms and armyworms. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a bit of an armyworm problem and quite a few fields did get sprayed for armyworms. Um, later in the season, once we got into July, or later into July, people started noticing these clusters of what people were thinking were eggs at the top of the cereal heads. And I got multiple um, photos being sent to me from agronomists and farmers saying, what are these egg masses? Are these armyworm eggs? do we need to worry about potential problems in a few weeks? And the answer here was, uh, nope, not armyworm eggs. These are pupa clusters of Cotesia. So what happens here is Cotesia, the adult lays eggs into the armyworms. They don't lay just one egg though. Usually they will lay 20, 30, 40, sometimes even more eggs into the same caterpillar. These eggs are all the same age. That caterpillar gets really sick from all these larvae living inside it, eventually dies. Uh, often they will climb up on the plant and you will see them fairly high in the canopy um, as they're uh, dying essentially. Um, so they're behaving differently than armyworms behave. Usually armyworms during the day are on the ground curled up uh, the parasitized ones when they're really sick might be up on the plants during the day. What tends to happen is when the Cotesia larva start emerging from the armyworm, it happens all at once. So if you've got 30 Cotesia inside the same caterpillar, 
they will all come out within a minute or two. It happens very quickly. And actually the photo that's on the upper left uh, was one that I took, um, I was coming in from a lunch break one day, my summer student said something really weird is happening um, in your armyworm colony. And we looked in and yeah, one of the armyworms just had a cluster of these Cotesia larvae coming out of it. And that's what happens. And as soon as they come out as larvae, they immediately will spin a silky cocoon around themselves. And when you've got 20 or 30 of them, then you get this cluster up on the plant. So if you see that, that's a good thing. That means you've had some parasitism happening in your field. And uh, I can't talk about uh, parasitic wasps without talking about the ones that make aphid mummies, because this is a very highly visible um, form of parasitism for many. Uh, what you will end up seeing is these shells of the aphid corpses that after they've been parasitized, the, the aphid dies, but it, the aphid becomes a home for the wasp larva. So you've got a larva that would have been living in all these um, aphid shells. As the um, uh, larva started emerging out of the aphids, you have a little hole in the back of them. One of the species we have in Manitoba, Aphidius irvi, it occurs naturally. You can also buy these as biocontrol agents. So people with greenhouses will often buy these and release them. A great way of controlling aphids in greenhouse situations. And they can be highly effective. Uh, you can see in this photo what the uh, wasp is doing. When the wasp detects an aphid, it will really quickly whip its abdomen around and lay an egg into the aphid. And I do have a video that shows this in action. So I'm gonna play the video and see if you can see every time the wasp touches an aphid, see if you can see it whipping its abdomen around and laying an egg into the uh, aphid. The green peach aphids had taken over the crop, but their reign was ending. Enter Aphidius irvi, a parasitoid capable of ravaging their populations. Our hero makes quick work of the aphids in record speed, turning these pesky yield suckers into a living host, growing an army of crop defenders to fight another day. Okay, so hopefully you were able to see um, the, the parasite whipping its uh, abdomen around, laying the eggs into those aphids. So that's what's happening in your field when uh, these parasitic wasps are present. They're looking for things like aphids and putting their eggs into them. Um, another parasitic wasp that has very successfully been uh, released into Manitoba is a parasite called Tetrastichus julis. And this was purposely released um, let me see, probably about uh, almost 15 years ago now, um, we found an insect called cereal leaf beetle in Manitoba, first in the Northwest. And it was a new uh, arrival in Manitoba, uh, a new potential crop pest. Um, I sent a sample of these newly found beetle larvae to a colleague in Alberta who liked dissecting the larva, looking for parasites. We had 0% parasitism which wasn't a good thing. And my worry was being a newer beetle that feeds on uh, cereal crops, uh, would this get out of hand? My colleague sent me some parasitic wasps and right from year one when we found these beetles, we started releasing parasitic wasps everywhere we found them. And I stopped doing releases a few years ago and, but I kept tracking the parasitism rates in the larva of the cereal leaf beetle. And even years later, we were finding very heavy parasitism rates. And even in areas where I hadn't done releases, I was finding sometimes 50 to 60% of the cereal leaf beetle larva had parasites in them. So the release seems to have taken well. I'm not aware of spraying for cereal leaf beetle in Manitoba. The parasites seem to be containing them. Uh, so this is an example of uh, biocontrol that can be effective. Maybe someday the parasite levels will get low enough 
the cereal leaf beetle will become an economic problem. Right now, the parasitic wasps seem to have them in check. So we'll just hope that that continues. So um, we've got this uh, huge diversity of beneficial insects helping us on our farms. And one of the big challenges is, so how do you control insect pests and do minimum harm to the beneficials? So that's always a huge challenge. So here's a few pointers and tips to consider. One is use the economic thresholds that we have. Um, if you are spraying for insects when you don't need to be spraying, especially if it's a broad spectrum insecticide, there can be a lot of good guys that you're taking out and you can actually be uh, secondarily creating pest problems on your farm by taking out the things that are regulating the, uh, the crop pests. Where you have the option, you could consider using selective insecticides. So things that will target a particular group of insects. Just to give you a few examples, we have a few products for aphids now, such as carbine, safina, that kill aphids and not much else. So if you have a soybean aphid problem or say aphids and peas, you could consider using one of these products, um, which will kill the pest, but not all the natural enemies. For some insects, like say cutworms, sometimes grasshoppers, you can spray either a field edge or a patch in a field. That takes good scouting to know where are the populations heavy and do we need to spray the whole field or can we get away with just doing a patch or a strip? Uh, that means you're preserving all the beneficials within the field if that part of the field doesn't need to be um, sprayed. Also, rotate your crops. Um, I can't stress this enough. There are some insects, a good example, wheat midge. If you grow wheat on wheat on wheat, um, they don't have to work to find your crop the next year. You increase your risk of them becoming a problem, which means you are at higher risk of doing more insecticide applications. So good crop rotation does help. And as mentioned earlier, having a good variety of flowering crops or plants around your farmyard uh, will provide habitat and the um, nectar and pollen resources that some of our beneficials really like. If by chance, you do need to spray a crop in flower, but you've got um, bees in the crop. And if it's in flower, you probably will have bees. Few things you can do to try and minimize the harm you do. Um, you could spray either late evening or early morning. Late evening is best. Once it cools down sufficiently, honeybees and some other bees will leave the field. They will um, go to their hives or nesting area overnight and come back the next day. So if you're spraying late evening, you're at least not making direct contact with the bees. And if you use a product that once it dries, doesn't have um, toxic residual to bees, then you will minimize your harm. Uh, contact local beekeepers that might be nearby if you are spraying a flowering crop. They will often cover their hives for a day or move the hives just to uh, minimize the damage that is being done. And there are some insecticides that are less toxic to bees. Well, an example being Corrigen. Um, great on grasshoppers, great on Lepidoptera, uh, doesn't kill Hymenoptera, uh, which is your bee and wasp group. So there are some, that's a semi-selective product. The aphicides I mentioned earlier, carbine, safina, um, they don't kill bees either. So there's a few products that we can use um, when bees are around. Uh, if that's an option to use a more selective product, that can be helpful as well. And just to wrap up, um, a resource that might be helpful for anyone who wants more information on beneficial insects, there's a a newer uh, field guide that, that has come out. This is by our Field Heroes group. We're basically a group of entomologists that decided we needed more information on beneficial insects. So uh, we've created a podcast, some videos, fact sheets, and a field guide called Pest and Predators Field Guide. 
so this field guide is kind of the reverse of uh, our previous guide that we did on uh, field and forage crop pests and their natural enemies. The natural enemies were a sideline in that publication. In this publication, the natural enemies are at the forefront. So we have um, a two page spread on each of our major natural enemies. And uh, we do cover our pests, but they're at the back in this one um, to give the beneficials Again, the, the forefront in this publication. This is a free publication. All you gotta do is go to fieldheroes.ca and you'll get a form. You put your name, your address, your mailing address, hit submit, and you would get a free copy of this. So if you're looking for more information on beneficial insects, this might be helpful. And just to summarize, um, insects have many beneficial roles on the farm, one being predators and parasitoids. Uh, some of our predaceous insects can have very big appetites. We saw how lady beetles can eat up to 100 aphids per day per individual. So some can have a major impact. Um, don't underestimate the parasitoids. Their numbers can be high and they can be doing a lot of good as well. And consider using strategies to preserve these beneficials whenever you can. So we'll end with that. And I think we've got a few minutes. If there's any questions, Lionel, I can take questions. Uh, okay, good. Uh, yeah, John, there has been some questions that have come in. Um, when you talked about uh, lady beetles and uh, the amount that they can eat in a day, uh, how does that compare to, say, the reproductive reproduction of aphids by, uh, I guess, by the, pred by the, by the aphids? Yeah, and, and uh, what makes aphids um, so successful in one sense is uh, aphids are reproductive machines. Uh, for most of the season, you don't have males in the population, it's just females. And a newly born aphid in a week or two can lay their own live females. So they're, they're, they're reproductive machines. And uh, when you get optimal conditions, most, for most aphid species, mid to high 20s is optimal and they can reproduce at really high rates. Um, so low levels of natural enemies, let's say um, low levels of lady beetles, hoverflies, they just can't keep up and the aphids will get ahead. So in situations like that, the aphids are building quicker than the natural enemies can eat them. But you do hit a level, and I, I don't have a number I could throw at you for lady beetles alone, um, some of this information, the, the data that I showed you earlier is built into the apps that calculate this, but uh, you do get to a level where the natural enemies, whether it's lady beetles, hoverflies, lace wings, it's usually a combination, you get to a level where they will be stabilizing the population. So aphids are still reproducing, natural enemies are feeding, but things are relatively stable. But then you can get to a point where uh, the natural enemies are consuming more aphids than they are producing and aphid levels go down. Um, one of the myths that I once heard from a farmer uh, was that, well, once you get aphids, they just keep building. There is no stopping them. Um, in their mind, things just happened exponentially. And that's not true. Um, it depends on the level of natural enemies. It can be either that exponential growth, like he was discussing, but it can be um, stabilized and even be decreasing depending on numbers. Okay, so that kind of falls into the next kind of question or point that someone made is a lot of time uh, the insect damage is at a critical period and we, we do the beneficials do the work fast enough, I guess. Uh, again, it depends on the situation and it really varies. And this is um, where you need, first of all, good crop scouting. And the unfortunate part is, aside from a couple um, aphid situations, we don't have good dynamic action thresholds that can help you with that decision making. So if you're scouting cutworms, say, and you notice that there's the odd ground beetle running around, do I have enough ground beetles that I don't need to worry about this? Uh, right now, we just don't have the science to be able to provide good answers. So right now, um, I always say that thresholds are a bit of an art and a science. We've got the economic part figured out for the pest. We don't 
have the economic part figured out for the natural enemies often. So it, sometimes it is more of a gut call than it is uh, something um, a scientific call. Um, with the exception that we've got aphid advisor and um, for soybean aphid and cereal aphid manager for cereal aphids. Okay, and um, is there any work being done uh, like the work that was done for the cereal uh, beetle uh, where um, insects are being worked on to have other releases? There's been research uh, going on, but we're not at the point right now where we're actively releasing wasps. Um, cereal leaf beetle, I had colleagues from Alberta, they, they had a huge colony going with this Tetrastichus julis, and they would send me several hundred and I'd go out and release them. Um, in the past, we have released the Phidias for aphids in Manitoba. And uh, believe it or not, decades ago, there was something released for flea beetles, but that didn't really work so well. Um, but the short answer though is no, I, we don't have anything right now where we've got something ready to be released. Um, work was done on something for root maggots, uh, a type of rove beetle actually. Um, and in the, the research, it looked very promising, but we're still not really at a point where we're going to be out there releasing rove beetles anytime soon. Okay, and then just one more, a um, lot of crickets this year, what were they after? Oh, good question. Um, and it's a complicated one actually. So crickets are omnivores. And um, so they eat lots of different things. Um, part of their diet is weed seeds. They, uh, they will eat, especially some of the larger weed seeds, lamb's quarters, pigweed, things like that. They will eat a lot of seeds. Uh, they will also eat grasshopper eggs. So that's some of the good side to crickets. Um, they will, they often do eat a lot of um, um, plant trash or uh, decaying plant material, ground level. Uh, very rarely do we see them climbing plants to eat uh, the economic part of our crops. We did see that somewhat this year. And I think what happened this year, we had a lot of late seeding and then the summer turned dry later on and we had a huge cricket population. So late in the season, uh, my speculation on what happened was they were looking for moisture um, later in the season. And we actually did see them climbing up onto canola pods, feeding on canola seeds, uh, feeding on cereal grains, um, flax bowls. So not very typical cricket behavior, but I'm thinking it was a combination of late seeding, dry conditions late in the season and lots of crickets. But they are omnivores, they feed on lots of things, um, insect pupae, grasshopper eggs, weed seeds, and some plant material. Okay, and just one comment here, John. I seen this in one of the articles that uh, uh, was in one of the papers and uh, it had a link to um, kind of a, a picture and a brief description. Uh, is that available? It was seemed like it was all work that you had done. Uh, is that available anywhere for people to see? Uh, um, uh, uh, a picture and a brief description of what, uh, Lionel? Uh, of the insect and, and the feeding it does and, and uh, uh, the groups that it, it's in. And uh, it was in Grain News, I think. Hmm, I'm not sure what insect you're referring to, though. Oh, no, this would just be like a guide. Uh, it's a guide to benefic beneficial insects that you... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that, that will likely be the pest and predator field guide that I showed. Okay. okay. Um, yes, yeah, so that's most likely. Um, that, again, that's freely available. Just type in fieldheroes.ca. Uh, you'll get to that. And it'll, you'll see, uh, it'll say order form download that and just ask you for your name and mailing address. You can get a free copy of that. Uh, if, and if you have any problems, email me. Uh, I'll make sure you get a free copy of that. Great. Okay, John, uh, thanks very much for doing uh, the presentation today. A lot of uh, really good information and uh, things that I think we need to know about when we go out into the field. So thanks again. Okay, thank you. I'm going to skip through a few slides here uh, just to because of of time wise, but uh, um, I want to let everybody know that uh, we're going to be um, uh, going into our spring uh, uh, webinars uh, following uh, starting on April the 12th. 
So uh, if you want to register for those, here's the link to do that. Uh, it's uh, something that we'll be doing on a weekly basis starting on April the 12th. So uh, uh, if you're interested, please join. And then just some closing information as usual, contact information for the crop extension specialists uh, throughout, the, throughout the province, our MASC offices, uh, where they're located. Um, I see a deadline coming up. I think the end of the month here is if you're making changes to your uh, cropping plans or uh, adding crops to your policy. So uh, uh, maybe just double check with your office if you're looking at doing any changing or adding land or things like that. Just uh, make sure you talk to them before the end of the month. Uh, our hay listing service, again, we have uh, quite a few uh, people with some bales uh, sitting there that they might be looking at marketing. Uh, if you're uh, having hay to sell, put it on our hay listing service, or if you're looking for, for feed, uh, go to that service. It's got some really good uh, information and locations of where some of the hay might be close to you. And uh, yeah, I put the fifth here, but I guess it's the 12th when we'll be starting our, uh, our spring crop talk. So uh, again, Thanks for attending and we will see you in April.